Okay, now we continue with uh, our present lecture uh, where we are trying to describe, uh, introduce the uh, fundamental concepts of systems and systems thinking. And uh, I think this is where we are at the present. Uh, we define the relevant environment of a system, the inputs and the outputs. The inputs are classified as either control inputs or uncontrollable inputs. Uh, the control inputs, when you represent them in a mathematical model, become the decision variables of your model. And we have measures of performance. And the important point here is that uh, we have to set the boundaries of the system. We have to define our system by identifying the boundaries that separate it from, from the environment. Here is a representation, graphical representation from our textbook, where several systems, inputs, outputs, etc., are indicated. As you can see here, there are two systems identified, system one and system two. And again, as you can see, these two systems are not necessarily distinct. They can overlap. For example, this component of the system uh, is, uh, is common to both systems. And then you can also see the environments. For example, system one has this environment indicated by broken lines, labeled as the environment for system one from which a system one receives inputs, okay, and sends back outputs, as you can see. Uh, each system can consist of several other smaller systems, which we call subsystems. Here is one subsystem, here is another. Again, subsystems can overlap. Uh, <clears throat> there, there might be components which are not members of the subsystems, but <coughs> members of the system itself. Etc. So this is a graphical representation which uh, uh, identifies all these uh, things. The, the connections between the components of the system are uh, relationships. We indicate the relationships by connecting the components. And most importantly, the, the, the thick lines are the boundaries. And uh, the, the question where the boundary is going to be set can we set the boundary at any place we like? If it is an ontological system, obviously we cannot. The system is out there, independent of us. It must have its own boundaries. But if you regard the system as a, as a mental construct, the boundaries are up to us to decide. Okay? So boundary setting is the term we use. We set the boundaries. Again, uh, inputs are sent into system two from its uh, relevant environment. Uh, and as you can see, the environments can also overlap. There is a further environment at the outside, as you can see, which you, can, which you might call the irrelevant environment. Okay? Irrelevant to what? Irrelevant to what? Irrelevant to our inquiry. Hmm? Irrelevant to our inquiry. In, it means that we don't have to take notice of components uh, sitting in, uh, in, the, in the irrelevant environment. <coughs> um, let's uh, start by uh, giving some examples for systems. A traffic system is obvious, I think, to all of us. A motor car is a, is a system. Uh, we have seen the definition and the component parts of the systems, both from Dalemba's description and also from Ekhoff's readings. A motor car, therefore, has parts which fit together and interact. The motor uh, interacts with the carburetor. The carburetor interacts with the uh, fuel tank, the fuel feeding system, etc. Uh, we, we know all these things. The motor car provides Transportation, something that none of its parts can. This is the important clause here. Uh, none of the parts of an automobile can provide transportation. Only the automobile as a whole or the motor car as a whole can tra provide transportation. Well, is this a system out there? Well, uh, at first sight, if you look outside and see a car parked in the, uh, in the parking uh, lot, 
you might think that it's a system sitting out there independent of us. But this may not be true all the time because, for example, uh, you know that uh, the automobile is for transportation, but transportation implies that you need a purpose for transformation. Now, the purpose for transformation that, for example, the car will take you uh, home after class uh, is something which depends on you, or if you want to go to not to shopping rather than home, uh, that's another thing. So, so immediately the motor car starts to become more complicated. Uh, it, it, it stops being something independent of you, but becomes a part of your purpose. You need also uh, a, re a driver if you can't drive yourself. A, a motor car will need a driver. And it will also require a road network. So th the motor car itself is not totally independent of its environment, as you can see. So it's a better idea to regard a motor car as a, as a system sitting in here, okay, as a mental construct. This is always true. Always it is safer to regard systems as something in your mind rather than independent of you. The point of this is that if you start regarding systems as independent of you, you are going to make mistakes. You are going to make mistakes in your thinking, in your analysis, in your profession. We shall uh, focus on this uh, possibility of making mistakes uh, uh, a little later on in more detail. Uh, even that is not uh, the end of the story. Some cars can be different things to different people. For example, uh, a car for you is a means of transportation, but for a person it might be a prestige symbol if it's a very nice and uh, expensive car. Uh, maybe you have bought it if you have a lot of money. You buy this car, not for transportation purposes only, but to show off to, to girls, for example. Huh? Or it could be a collection item. You might be collecting cars, etc. So it is. Uh, uh, it depends on not only the car itself, but uh, but to you as well. So a car may be better understood as a conceptual system rather than a system out there. Uh, a, a very nice example from the textbook is a system, a sawmill. Uh, a sawmill is a plant where timber is cut into pieces uh, as required by the industry, by construction industry, etc. So uh, we have a sawmill. Uh, I assume that you have read the, uh, the chapter. Uh, the details are given. Uh, now, here we are given a table uh, which describes the sawmill system from the perspective of different stakeholders. Uh, in the first column, we have the properties of the system. For example, purpose of viewing the entity as a system. What's your purpose of looking at the sawmill as a system? Then identifying the components of the system, then the activities of the system, relationships between components, inputs from the environment, etc. And uh, in the remaining three columns, uh, each uh, answer to these questions is provided in the three columns, uh, depending on uh, who is answering the questions. In the first column, the questions are answered by an industrial engineer. The second column uh, belongs to the owners of the sawmill. So the view of an industrial engineer of the sawmill will not be the same as the view of the sawmill uh, by the owner. And finally, you have another column called the, labeled as the management science analyst. Now, this example is very nice, but it is sometimes confusing to our students because the students cannot identify themselves. Uh, I mean, are confused with whom to identify. Uh, is, 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 are you the industrial engineer here? Or are you the management science analyst? Well, our uh, focus is the management science analyst, OK? Why do we have the industrial engineer here? Well, it is because of the uh, fact that in America, and all the textbooks are written for, um, for the American public, as you know. Uh, our textbook is also written mostly by keeping the American public in, in mind. 
And in America, the, in the United States, the industrial engineers, uh, they are understood by the writer of this book as uh, according to the traditional understanding of industrial engineering, which is uh, the fact that in a sawmill, the industrial engineers will be responsible only for the production system and nothing else. For example, they will not be, if you look at the uh, descriptions, the purpose of viewing uh, the sawmill as a system from the point of view of an industrial engineer is study the physical layout of equipment, product handling, and different operating rules. Mm -hmm. The industrial engineer would regard the sawmill as a system because he would like to study the layout of the place, <coughs> the operating principles, the, <coughs> the equipment that is used in production, etc. These are the traditional uh, entities that an industrial engineer is responsible for in a, in a, in a production situation. Uh, but if you look at the owner's uh, purpose, it says assess financial return on investments. I mean, the, the owners look at the sawmill as a system with the view in mind that this system is going to provide returns on their investments. A sawmill is an enterprise. Money has been put into the sawmill. And why do the owners put money into the sawmill system? Because they would expect profits from the system. So. Return on investment is the important thing to look at from the point of view of the owners. Uh, look, let's see how the analyst, the management scientist looks. Study effect on costs of different cutting patterns to meet given demand. So you can see that the, the focus or the perspective of the management science analyst includes both the perspective of the industrial engineer and of the owner, okay? This is the system's view. So don't be discouraged by looking at and seeing that. I mean, if I were writing this book, I wouldn't put industrial engineering there uh, at the label. So it's a little bit confusing. We identify ourselves with the last column, okay? Which looks at everything. Now, traditionally, it might be the case that in a sawmill or any similar production situation, the industrial engineers were really and truly responsible only for the physical layout of equipment, product handling, and operating rules. But believe me, this is no longer true. It's not true at all. The industrial engineers assume the role of the management science analyst. This is your current role. And when you take a job after next year, when you graduate, you will find yourselves in, in such positions in a production system, and you will be, of course, responsible for costs and profitability and all the operating rules and uh, cutting, cutting patterns of the, saw or the, the product mix and everything, okay? So the last uh, column is relevant for us. Now you can study uh, the details of, of this table on your own. It's, it, it will take too long for me to, to look at everything. And you can see, for example, uh, the inputs from the environment Will, will, will be different depending on who is looking at the inputs. Uh, from the point of view of the industrial in engineer, types of logs, uh, uncut logs, uh, are the input, obviously, because the system will process these into uh, finished products. Uh, supplies of oil and fuel, processing rates, capacities, etc., are the inputs. But from the point of view of the owners, the inputs are funds, uh, that's investment funds, money is the input, uh, personnel is the input, uh, commercial laws, pricing policy, etc., are the inputs. And uh, as you can see again, for the management science analyst, uh, usually everything is, uh, all the inputs here can be regarded as also the inputs viewed by the management science analyst, although what you see there can, may not include everything here, okay? So please make sure that you study this. Uh, in the quiz tomorrow, maybe you get a question related to this. Uh, I don't know, I'm not giving you a clue, but you, you should be uh, familiar with all the uh, examples that uh, we represent uh, from the textbook. So a sawmill. Now, let's go on uh, with the generalities for systems. Uh, there's this concept of hierarchy. 
systems are within systems, okay? There exists a hierarchy of systems. Let's take the sawmill example. The sawmill firm is embedded in a system of regional sawmills hmm? that are competitors. If the, the sawmill is probably located where some, where you have lots of woods, uh, raw material is available. Uh, in the Karadeniz region, for example, you have sawmills, and there are, of course, other competing sawmills. Uh, they are all sharing the same forest uh, resources. The system of regional sawmills is embedded in the national wood processing industry, etc. So uh, there are larger and larger systems uh, containing any given system, and they form a hierarchy. In general, the containing system exercises some control over the contained system <coughs> by setting the objectives, monitoring performance, and having control over crucial resources. For example, uh, the national uh, forestry industry uh, is subject uh, to the rules of the, to the dictates of the government and the state. And the government, uh, the republic, may put some restrictions on the use of forest products in sawmills. So the, the, the government controls the inputs to the sawmills, uh, things like that. The controlling system is then referred to as the wider system of interest, while the contained system becomes the narrow system of interest. Now, these two concepts are going to be used all the time, not only in this course, but in the uh, in, in the systems design courses next year, the two courses that you're going to take next year, you are going to have to identify within your project what the wider system is and what the narrow system is or where the narrow system is. Of course, identifying the narrow system with reference to the wider system means that you are going to do what? You are going to set the boundaries of the narrow system. When you set the boundaries of the narrow system, you will be able to identify the narrow system and the containing wider system. <clears throat> For example, if the sawmill cost minimizing system is the narrow system of interest, you see, in the sawmill, you have several systems, subsystems as well. Let's look at the cost minimizing system within the sawmill. What's the purpose of the sawmill? Is it to minimize costs? Probably the objective of the sawmill is to make money for the owners, not to minimize costs only. But to minimize costs is, a, is also an objective, probably. So there must be a system within the larger sawmill system, which, might, which we might call the cost minimizing system then the cost minimizing system will become the narrow system of interest. Then the sawmill profit maximizing system and its environment are going to be the wider system of interest. Now, why do we have to make this differentiation uh, between cost minimization and profit maximization? Well, in some cases of inquiry, you might be asked to minimize the costs of the sawmill operation, disregarding the objective of profit maximization only. So you need to identify your narrow system as composed of activities which incur costs. So you have to rearrange those activities uh, so that the costs are, the total costs are made minimum, okay? The advantage of viewing the two, I mean the, the narrow and the wider systems, is that their relationships are shown in the correct context. It may show that improvements in the performance of the narrow system <coughs> requires action to be taken in the wider system, for example. Similarly, the relationships between various inputs into the narrow system will be made clear. For example, all labor costs in the cost minimization system of the sawmill may depend on the union contract signed in the wider system. You would like to, for example, minimize labor costs but labor costs are subject to union contracts, syndical which takes place in the wider system, not in the narrow system. So all these will become clear uh, and you will, be, you will know what you're doing. <coughs> so here is, for example, uh, system one is the narrow system of interest, uh, which includes cost minimizing operations. 
it sits in the environment for system one, and this environment becomes system two, which is the wider system of interest to the narrow system, where you have customers, suppliers, marketing and sales, etc. So both systems are part of the sawmill system. If you take the sawmill example, as you can see, then there's the environment for the wider system, etc. So there's always such a hierarchy. Now let me give you a very strong clue of how to identify the narrow system. I mean, you cannot identify the narrow system using my clue, but when you, in the end, when you end up with a narrow system of interest, you will see that if you have constructed any mathematical model, for example, you have constructed some cost-minimizing inventory model or some profit-maximizing production model, production <coughs> optimization model, a mathematical model. This model will always belong to the narrow system of interest. So the narrow system is the system for which you are probably going to construct a mathematical model. Okay? The narrow system of interest is the interest on which uh, operational research focuses. I mean, when, when, when we say that it focuses, we don't mean that the wider system is disregarded. On the contrary, the wider system is kept in mind all the time. But the model itself, the if you are going to construct a mathematical model, it's not true that all of our projects require the construction of a mathematical model. Many of them, you cannot construct a mathematical model. You have to do something else. But if you are going to construct such a model, it will uh, the, be the mathematical representation of the narrow system of interest. OK, so uh, this dichotomy of uh, out there and inside us, we have repeated this several times. Uh, we just repeat it again. Uh, it's often more useful to regard systems as inside us, as mental constructs. System definitions are therefore necessarily subjective. If the system is not sitting outside independently of us, then we have to define where the system is, so it's subjective. And they are influenced by the purposes of and the interests of the observer as for example, uh, whether it is observed by the owners of the sawmill or by the management science panelists. Also, they are influenced by the Weltanschauung. We have mentioned this word before. Uh, here's a definition of uh, the concept of Weltanschauung. It's, it's called, it may be called the world view, but as I said, the German language is very strong in these concepts. And uh, the German words are used uh, directly in English uh, in order to not to, to, to dilute the definition. Each person interprets the world in terms of his or her own experiences and biases. <clears throat> hmm? You regard the world in terms of your own past experiences and <coughs> predilections and biases. <coughs> that is, repeated patterns of experience lead to a complex set of beliefs and values through which we perceive the world. So you have a set of beliefs and values that you regard in perceiving the world. <coughs> uh, so the set of these values and beliefs and accumulated experience that shape your perception of the world is called your Weltanschauung. And Weltanschauung is a taken for granted outlook of the world. It's taken for granted. What does it mean, taken for granted? If, it is something is, if something is taken for granted, you accept it. You do not question it. Weltanschauungs are not questioned. Okay? You accept it. Uh, now, a Weltanschauung belongs to a person, but if there are several people, uh, members of a set, for example, researchers, uh, chemists, uh, etc., mathematicians, for example, then if they share the same Weltanschauung formally, then we call this a paradigm. Hmm? So a paradigm is a related concept, uh, but it is more formal. 
Now, let's let, take this example of the Olympic Games. Now, you know that the Olympic Games are held in, uh, in, a, in a city of uh, every four years, and the cities <coughs> compete for holding this, these games. For example, there was some talk about Istanbul holding the, I don't know, 2012 games, etc. But then we forgot about it. Uh, fortunately, we, we forgot about it. <laughs> Uh, I think it's going to be held in uh, London. Uh, well, suppose the, uh, uh, the IOC, IOC is the International <coughs> Olympic Committee, uh, which decides where the games are going to be held. Um, they decide, for example, to conduct a system study of the future of the Olympic Games. And they invite you, as OR <coughs> and industrial engineers, to look into this uh, question of what is going to be the future of these games. So the system of concern are the games. But you see, uh, immediately there will be complications. The system would be very differently described, and so the system's objectives will also be differently described by the International Olympic Committee itself. I have colored all these in different colors, showing you as many different points of view as the colors uh, we have. By the host city, the host city will look at the games from a different perspective. By would-be host cities, by cities who would like to hold games in the future, they will regard the games from a different point of view. By athletes, by athletes, coaches, by officials, by spectators, by hot dog sellers, hot dog sandwich sellers. You know, sellers uh, sell sandwiches uh, uh, to the spectators. And if you have a, a football match or Olympic Games, they make a lot of money. So they regard the Olympic Games uh, very differently. Uh, by sponsors, by television companies, by television viewers who have no interest in athletics. Eh? For example, if you are sitting and trying to watch the game uh, from the TV and your wife doesn't like uh, to watch uh, games, instead she wants to watch a movie. Uh, you have a different conception of the games altogether. Uh, you hate, uh, for example, uh, well, when, anyway. <coughs> Your wife uh, hates the Olympics because she cannot uh, watch uh, her movies. This list could go on and on, and this is what happens as soon as you move outside technically defined problem situations into human problem situations, okay? So problem situations that some concepts we have already uh, studied uh, <clears throat> are, are very complex uh, for this reason, because a system that you would like to study in a problem situation is different things to different people, to different stakeholders. It illustrates that multiple conflicting objectives from multiple stakeholders are the norm in human situations. Norm means the normal situation. The normal situation in, 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 in problem situation is that there will be multiple stakeholders having multiple and different and conflicting objectives. In other words, reality can only be known through our own, our perceptions, which are necessarily shaped by our worldview. This means that subject-object duality cannot be assumed to hold in social systems. So the most important uh, uh, fundamental principle of positivism, which is the subject-object duality, uh, cannot be assumed to hold uh, in our studies. The only valid type of objectivity, okay? Now, if, if subject-object duality fails, we have a problem. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that how can we objective? How can our research be objective? We would like our research and inquiry to be objective. <coughs> it should not be subject to distortions and biases. It should not serve, for example, only the interests of a group of people, etc. It should be, well, it could, it could serve the interest of a group of people, but while doing that, it should also take into account the interests of all the other stakeholders. And the decision must be arrived at knowing these interests altogether, okay? So we have to be objective. How can we be objective if the subject, that is 
the person who is doing the inquiry, cannot be separated from the object. This is a very serious problem. The answer to this is the following. Well, we are not giving up on objectivity. We are giving up on the subject of object duality principle. We know that it doesn't work. But we are not saying that objectivity does not work. We have to maintain some sort of objectivity in our inquiry. This objectivity is consensual objectivity. That is, it must be socially decided. Who is going to make this decision? The stakeholders all are going to make this decision to say that, well, we have done an <coughs> inquiry which is sufficiently objective for our purposes. This means that unlike the scientific objectivity claim of positivism, systems thinking accepts that truth and validity can only be decided dialectically through a process of negotiation. Now, don't think that this is only true for systems thinking and for industrial engineering. This is true for physics. This is true for astronomy. This is true for all the sciences. All the sciences have now come to the realization that objectivity has to be consensual. We have to decide by negotiation whether we have achieved objectivity. This is even true in mathematics, you see. You cannot imagine, in, in mathematics, you make a proposition. You start with definitions. Huh? You start with a set of axioms. Based on the, these axioms, you make a proposition, and then you prove that proposition by reference to the axioms. OK, this is what, how mathematics works. And when, when you prove the validity of a theorem, or of a proposition, that proposition becomes a theorem, like the Pythagoras theorem, for example. And, and we, have no, we should have no uh, reason to doubt the validity of the theorem, because in mathematics, proof is possible. In science, is proof possible? In science, proof is not possible. You see, you cannot prove anything in science. Proof only occurs in mathematics and logic. In the real world, there is no such thing as proving anything. Knowledge is not absolute. Hmm? The, the strongest uh, weapon or the strongest uh, attribute of science is the fact that science does not accept ab absolute knowledge. So science does not accept proof. Now, didn't I talk about the impossibility of Proof in science before? Well, you see, science works <coughs> in two ways. First, you have to have accumulated knowledge, accumulated from past experience. This knowledge is called theory. We have theory. If you are a physicist working in physics, you have a huge amount of collected, accumulated knowledge, which you can call theory. What's the other component of science? The other component is empirical. The empirical component includes observations and experimentation. In some sciences, experimentation is possible. In some sciences, it's not possible. For example, in physics, experimentation is possible. The idea is, once you propose a new proposition, taking advantage of your scientific knowledge, of your theory, and by making observations in, in, in nature uh, in respect of some phenomena, you might make a new proposition. This new proposition we usually call a hypothesis. Then, in order to add this hypothesis to your accumulated uh, body of theory, you have to test the hypothesis. The test is always empirically, empirically done. You have to, the hypothesis cannot be tested in theory. It has to be tested in practice. 
by experimentation or by observation. If you are able to conduct experiments, then your test is more powerful. The experiments are also classified in many categories. There are, for example, controlled experiments. If you can conduct a controlled experiment, as for example they have done in the Hawthorne study, by having control groups and things like that, or even more powerful than that, if you can uh, conduct your experiment in a laboratory, in the laboratory, the world stops. All the change in the world is stopped in the, in the laboratory, and only one variable is allowed to change. And then you uh, view whether this change produces an effect. Huh? This is the most powerful weapon of science, the laboratory. That is why the laboratory sciences are the most advanced sciences. If, if your system cannot fit into a laboratory, for example, in economics, you cannot bring the system into the laboratory. If you are doing economics as a social science, then you cannot rely on experimentation. What are you going to rely on? You have to rely on observations. Observations are not as powerful as experiments because in observations, everything is changing all the time together. You cannot stop some variables and allow only a few variables to change. So this is how science works. The proofs are by induction. The propositions we propose are usually deduced from theory by deduction, but the proofs are always inductive. Which means what? <clears throat> for example, you make a proposition. <clears throat> there are classical examples, as you know. For example, uh, th this bird, uh, the, this, uh, the uh, water bird, swan. Huh? What's it in Turkish? Cool. The swan, swans are white. Huh? You, you observe many, many swans, and you propose uh, the hypothesis that all swans are white. <coughs> now, each viewing of a of a swan and seeing that it is white seems to corroborate your hypothesis. Our hypothesis, does a hypothesis pass a test? You see, hypothesis, well, going back to the example of swans, for many, many years people thought that all swans are, are, are white. But then Europeans went to, the, to Australia. Hmm? Uh, Captain Cook or somebody, the British, went to Australia. They uh, started to uh, populate Australia. And they discovered that there were black swans in Australia. Now, when you observe one black swan, then your hypothesis is rejected. When you observe, when you have not obse observed any black swans, but you are observing white swans, your hypothesis is not rejected. Your hypothesis is not rejected. It doesn't mean that it has been proved. It is just not rejected. OK? Induction has this weakness. Induction never ends. In some instant, for example, Newton's laws of gravity were assumed to hold in every replication, in every test, Newton's uh, laws of gravity, for example, was verified in all the experiments for about 200 years or more until uh, Einstein uh, proposed his uh, theory of relativity. And an experiment was conducted to show that light coming to Earth, but in the way there is another heavenly body, when light comes across that body, it bends around it like that, and then reaches the Earth. This was verified experimentally through uh, observation through uh, telescopes and things like that, experimentally. And uh, it was seen that even the law of gravity does not hold under certain conditions. OK? So uh, science does not accept uh, absoluteness in truth. Uh, there is no uh, such thing as absolute knowledge or absolute truth, and there is no proof in science. All the accumulated knowledge we might call theories are, in fact, a collection of what? 
a collection of hypotheses which are not yet rejected. Okay? This is what science is. Uh, I think you had uh, a quiz question or something like that can with cancer, associated with cancer and necessary cause and effects. Did, did you have that quiz? Well, that quiz is just uh, addresses this situation in science. Uh, in order to prove something, you have to do it as it is in mathematics, if and only if, both necessary. If something is the cause of something else, if A causes B, then A must be both necessary and sufficient for B to occur, okay? In induction, by using induction, we cannot prove this. There are people who get cancer, although they don't smoke at all, and there are people who smoke a lot, but do not get cancer. So, uh, truth and reality, the objectivity in seeking truth and reality is subjective to, is subject to dialectical, the dialectical negotiation. Uh, I was trying to give you the example, an example from mathematics. In mathematics, you don't need any observations. You don't need any experimentation. So subject-object duality must be perfectly valid in mathematics. There was a theorem uh, proposed some, some years ago, three or four years ago, about uh, providing proofs by computer, Co computer, computational, it's called computational proving. And a paper was, was, was subject, uh, submitted to a very prestigious mathematics journal, and for, there was a theorem in that paper. For several years, mathematicians could not decide whether the, the, the proof was correct or not. You see? Even in mathematics, objectivity is subject to consensus, even in mathematics. I don't want to go into the details of that theorem. It's very, very, it was a very important, it was uh, front page news in the New York Times at the time, yeah, and in newspapers also. So even in mathematics, probably, absolute truth is, uh, do, does not exist, okay? But let's leave mathematics alone. <laughs> in mathematics, we can prove things, okay? <clears throat> now, uh, in, in systems thinking, there are two, decisions always we have to make in all industrial engineering practice, you have to make always two decisions and these are very, very important. The first decision is called boundary setting and the second decision is called separation of scales or scale setting. In order for systems thinking to be effective, we have to be careful when we decide, one, where to set the boundary. This is called boundary setting or a boundary judgment, huh? a boundary judgment, and the boundary setting is the same thing. And the second decision we make is what level of detail or scale to adopt. This is called scale setting or separation of scales. These are the only, well, I wouldn't say only, these are the two devices that will, the, the, two, two, the two most <laughs> important devices that will help us deal with complexity. Now let's discuss this boundary setting in uh, some more detail. Supposing we define the environment, now boundary setting, of course, means to identify the system and the environment, the separation uh, between these two. Suppose we define the environment as that part of the world that lies beyond our control. The easiest way to define the environment is to say that the components of the system which we cannot control lie in the environment and the components which we can control lie in the system. Now, this, is, this looks like a reasonable definition. But it's not uh, clear how far our control extends. For example, suppose you are a production company like a sawmill. You are producing your products and then you are putting them out to the market for sale. So there are your customers. Are your customers in your system or are they in the environment? Now, according to 
to, to the first statement. If you cannot control them, they should be regarded as in the environment, as part of the environment. Now, some of your customers you cannot control. Is this true? Can you not control your customers? What is a way of controlling the demand, let's say? The customers represent a demand for your product. The price. Huh? The price is the easiest variable that you can manipulate. If you lower your price, your customers will probably buy more. So the customers, even they may look as if they are out of your control, are not really out of your control. Then there is, for example, the government, the local authority, which puts regulations on your operations. For example, they want you not to, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, put out garbage into the environment or work ag according to regular hours, etc., etc., rules and regulations. Are they out of your control? The rules of the local government, for example, the Belediye. Well, they look like as if they are out of your control, but even you know that powerful companies can influence the government to take decisions according to their uh, interests. So it is difficult uh, <clears throat> to decide where the boundary is. If the boundary is set too tight, there is a danger of leaving out important system parts and interrelationships. If the boundary is set too wide, if you include many things into your boundary, then there will be too many components and interrelations, and it will be difficult to understand and to handle them. So boundary setting is problematic, as we shall continue tomorrow.